hope everybody's safe and sound uh, during this polar vortex. It's a little behind me so you can see some trees. It's really uh, pretty, pretty cool looking out there. Um, anyway, I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, belief, the step two of the, uh, the Passport to Creativity system. And what I want to talk about now is really about self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, it sounds way more grandiose than it really is, but the idea is basically uh, we basically set in motion our own um, expectations. And uh, so I'm going to go through a couple of stories that are um, pretty powerful to me uh, that hopefully will really um, solidify this idea that um, <clears throat> believing is the key to, uh, to being creative. Um, I mentioned a few other uh, examples about why believing uh, helps you be creative, but these are more subconscious. I wouldn't say these are as conscious as the ones I've previously uh, referenced. So, so this first story about self-fulfilling prophecy is one that's actually pretty old, and so you might have heard of it, but it never hurts to hear these again because I think they reinforce how powerful our beliefs are. So <clears throat> basically, it's a, uh, a, a teacher was given a class, and she was, you know, she normally didn't teach this class. You know, she was told this this class is actually, you know, quite above average and and almost gifted. So you know, please don't mess this up. We you know we we don't have anybody else to, to take this class for us. So she you know she took that to heart and she you know she gave her lessons and she taught the taught the students. And when it was uh when her you know time was over, um you know sure enough the students showed yep above average almost gifted perfect good job. Um, but here was the catch they weren't. They didn't show any aptitude. They didn't show anything special. But she taught them as if they were, and they responded accordingly. I, I love that example, and hopefully that can touch you and help you feel, yes, this is really about belief. So the next story I want to share is uh, controversial. It's about race. And I don't presume to know everything about what happened. Um, and I personally know that I have bias. I'm not going to be blind to that. This is a gray issue. But I want to share this because I think it's very powerful. And I think it's something, it moved me. I saw this in third grade or fourth or fifth grade. And I never forgot it. And um, later I watched it and I saw an additional part that I didn't remember that has to do with self-fulfilling prophecies and belief. And that's why I want to share it with you. So this next story um, really moves me, and it's a little long, so I'm going to break it into three parts. First, I'm going to set it up, then I'm going to tell you what happened, and then I'm going to talk about how it affects self-fulfilling prophecy and belief. But the first part is really about a third grade teacher who chose to teach her students, uh, all white students, what it was like to be discriminated against. And so she taught them by discriminating against them based on their eye color. She told the brown-eyed students that they were inferior, that they were troublemakers, that they were um, not good people. And she said vice versa that the blue-eyed students were superior and uh, smart and kind and giving and essentially you know better in every way. And to make it easy to identify them, she put collars on the brown-eyed students so they could be identified from a distance. After she, you know, told these students that their <clears throat> the brown-eyed students were inferior, she did a really good job of identifying ways that they were. Um, you know, she basically kind of pushed their buttons and would point things out. She'd look for somebody who was a troublemaker and show everybody, see, that's a brown-eyed student. And, you know, it, was, it didn't take long, especially for thir third graders, um, who even volunteered for this exercise uh, before getting into it, not knowing what they were asking for. Um, but uh, very quickly, they, you know, the blue-eyed students reveled in being superior and the brown-eyed students felt guilty and were treated uh, badly and, and reacted as such, uh, acted out. Um, there was a fight, you know, he hit me because I was, he called me brown eyes was kind of an aspect of it. So it, it didn't take long for these students to really uh, accept the roles of this discrimination. The next thing that occurred was the next day, actually, the teacher admitted that she was actually uh, a blue-eyed person and so she had lied to the students and it was actually the other way around. It was actually the blue-eyed students who were inferior and the brown-eyed students were the superior ones. And so, you know, the students actually, they changed collars. So now the blue-eyed students had the collars 
and the teacher was effective. She actually was able to escalate uh, the, um, you know, kind of proving the point of the fact that blue-eyed students were bad because, you know, she herself had lied. Uh, so she was able to literally get them to kind of realize, yeah, you're right, it is the blue-eyed that are inferior. And so within one day, she was able to completely change the idea that who was inferior versus inferior, superior, and they bought in very quickly, very impressionable. So this next part, um, it usually brings me to tears, so I apologize if I cry. But uh, the students came together and were able to share what had occurred and how they felt. And it was very clear that when students were in the superior position, you know, they felt great. They felt better about themselves. It was nice to have some kind of reason to be better. Uh, and at the same time, the, those who felt inferior, even the same people who felt inferior when they were in that place, they could tell that... It was so frustrating, it was so, they were trapped. They couldn't act out without reinforcing this idea that they were not good. And so, uh, you know, at the end, they were able to, you know, get rid of those collars, they threw them away. <laughs> and they recognized how easy it is to find a reason to discriminate, and at the same time, how baseless it is. So hopefully that story showed how belief can reinforce behavior and our behaviors can reinforce our beliefs and create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, you know, that story was obviously uh, very powerful related to discrimination. Um, but there was an actual additional part of that story that came out that I want to share. This story is obviously tremendously powerful around discrimination, but it's also powerful around self-limitation because the teacher actually tested the students before, during, and after the exercise. And what they found was on the days the students felt superior, their scores were markedly higher. And on the days that they were considered the inferior uh, eye color, their scores were lower. And after they were done, their scores were consistently higher. They were able to discover they were limiting themselves somehow and that they were able to realize how to end that limitation and move forward without stopping themselves. So I hope those stories were clear. I know I got emotional, um, but hopefully they were clear examples of self-fulfilling prophecies and why limiting beliefs can uh, stop us from fulfilling what we really are able to achieve. And so uh, I'm going to end this with just asking you if you want to write down uh, any beliefs that you believe may be limiting you uh, in your efforts to be creative or if you believe you're not talented. I know I've, I've had a ton of them. I'm working through them. It's a, it's a process. But uh, to not recognize that they're there uh, you know, they're, they're always there, so if you can f identify them, that'll help you uh, kind of separate yourself from them.